Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Show where we talk about health tips and strategies to help you be smart, sexy, and strong. On today's show, you might notice a slightly different background than what you're used to seeing if you're watching the video. That's because I'm at my sister's house in Los Angeles. I'm really excited to have my friend Summer Bach on the show. And Summer is a master fermentationist whose mission is to radically improve people's health while empowering them to revolutionize the local food system using delicious, local, and healthy food. A skilled herbalist with a background in microbiology, she is certified by the Institute of Integrative Nutrition and Columbia University. Summer has created an avid following with her signature programs, the Probiotic Power Cleanse, Gut Rebuilding, and the Year-Long Fermentationist Certification Program. On today's show, we talk about probiotics and fermented foods, what these are, why you want more of these, and how to start making fermented foods in your own kitchen. We also cover how probiotics and fermented foods help with a variety of health problems and really help support our digestion, our immune system, skin, and even our mood. So please enjoy the show. Today I have as my guest, Summer Bach. It's so great to have you on, Summer. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So, Summer, you definitely have your own personal journey that got you on this path. Let's start with that. Tell us about your journey and what got you here. Well, I mean, I was actually really sick and I didn't know it. I think that's the part that's the most interesting. I was studying herbal medicine. I lived in New Mexico and I was at this full-time training program to become an herbalist. And we did a cleanse during this like week of class. And during that cleanse, it felt like I had a wool blanket pulled out of my brain. I mean, I literally looked around and was like, oh, everything's so crystal clear, so beautiful. Um, And I remember being like, oh, wow, I'm not anxious. I feel grounded. I actually feel kind of amazing. And it was the first time I had ever felt like that in my entire life. And I was 21 years old. And from that point forward, just having such a stark contrast Um, I really started to see what my issues were. I went back to eating how I normally ate and all of my health concerns really started to to get clear to me because I had something to compare it to. And over the next few years with stress and college and all of this, some of those health concerns exacerbated. And I, I got to the point where I was multiple chemical sensitivity. Like I couldn't walk down the grocery store aisle without, you know, having a migraine headache from all of the perfumes Um, I suffered from panic attacks. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a panic attack, sometimes during the day. I had allergies, uh, environmental, as well as food. It got to the point where I was like 20 to 30 foods that I could eat without a reaction. I had acne and rashes. Like I had all these rashes that would kind of like appear and disappear and move around. Um, I'd get hives really easily. And um, I was just suffering from a lot of anxiety and and you know, for the most part, really, really uncomfortable in my own skin. So that's kind of what I was dealing with and, um, you know, realized that I needed to do something about this and worked on this for years, trying to find a practitioner who could help me. And I couldn't really find anybody who could help me like fix it all the way. Like people kept giving me little tidbits here and there. And finally I showed up to my doctor, my MD, I'd been to NDs, I'd been to chiropractors, I'd been to acupuncture. I'd, I'd done a lot of stuff. I show up in my MD and she's like, what are you doing here? And by this point, it'd been years. I had graduated from IIN, um, got certified through Columbia University in integrative nutrition. And I'm working with clients and like helping people with their health. And I'm still really suffering. But I'd figured out how to eat really clean. And I had figured out a lot of stuff. So I sit down and my doctor, she's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, what do you mean? My eyes are swollen, like allergies. I don't feel good. Like, She's like, you're a healthy something, you know, a healthy 20 something year old. You know, she's like, I don't know what you're doing here. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to write a prescription. You're not going to take it. I don't think it's really going to do that much for you anyway. So what are you doing here? And I was like, oh my God. I mean, it was terrifying. And the crazy part was that she goes, you know more about this than I do. And I was like, okay. And she was sending her patients to me. Like I was working with her patients. I was health coaching them already. And, you know, I walked away from that appointment completely life changer for me because I realized, okay, I'm going to take hundred percent responsibility for my health now, just 
I'm going to do it. It's on me. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to cure myself of my allergies. And that became my goal. And I did. And, you know, I've reached this point. I don't have multiple chemical sensitivity anymore. I don't have rashes. Like all of this stuff has gone away. I mean, I still have to eat pretty, pretty good. You know, I can't just like go out and like eat a bunch of pizza or anything. I'll get sick from gluten. So I avoid gluten and dairy. But other than that, I'm, it's like night and day different. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really a big deal. That's great. What a, what a great success story that you've been able to turn your life around. And I know that there are a lot of people out there that are experiencing some of the symptoms that you're talking about. And even one of the first things you talked about is you feel like somebody pulled a wool blanket off from you. And I think that a lot of people don't realize how bad they feel until they feel better. So I wanted to call that out because it's, you know, I think a lot of people are just going through life, feeling tired, living off of one coffee to the next and dragging through and not realizing how good you can feel, how much energy you can have, how much clearer your thinking can be and all these things. So I'm so excited to talk with you about what turned things around for you. Let's talk about fermented foods and how that became part of your healing journey. Yeah, well... So it was interesting. I had been taking herbs and trying all these different things for all the different issues for like taking stuff for my skin, taking stuff for my allergies, you know, trying to take liver herbs to help clear some of that up. Like I was doing all these different things. And then I went and did some more research and I realized that all of the symptoms that I was dealing with all stemmed from my gut. Like they were all connected. And so I scrapped everything that I was doing and just focused on my gut. And at that point, I started taking probiotics. That was helping. And I just started figuring out how do I nourish my digestive system? How do I get more nutrition? How do I start to digest things better? And how do I start to look at my digestive health as the, the main thing to focus on, understanding that that will get the rest to, um, to get better? And you know that's, that worked pretty good, but it was when I added fermented foods in and started getting, because I'm an herbalist. I want to know how did people get probiotics in their diet 5,000 years ago? You know, how did they do it? And I, I realized like the whole food version of probiotics is fermented foods like sauerkraut, like kefir and yogurt to an extent. I mean, my favorite really is sauerkraut as I'll, I'll talk about through this and kimchi and, and the, the fermented veggies because of the probiotic content. But the thing about these, pro these foods is that they have the probiotics, these live beneficial bacteria living in them, but they also have lactic acid and a bunch of other like substances that we call bacteriocins and um, various byproducts that they're producing. These are part of what makes them work so well in your body. The lactic acid is a natural antibiotic. So it kills bad bacteria that shouldn't be living in your body. You know, I mean, and maybe we should back up for a second and just, you know, I mean, maybe people know this already, but you have for every one human cell in your body, you have 10 bacterial cells. So they outnumber our cells 10 to one, which is significant. We have two to three pounds of bacteria living in our gut in a healthy person, like two to three pounds. Like that's, I don't know, that probably looks like some mass like this. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's a, it's a lot. And people are so bacteria phobic these days. Yeah. It's true. And if they're the wrong bacteria, here's the problem. And this is what I realized about my own health. And this is what really shifted things. What I call it. Um, this, okay. So when you have these bad bacteria growing in your system, they get there from three main causes. Um, overuse of antibiotics, taking them way too many times. Um, stress. I mean, high stress. And that, that doesn't even mean just emotional, mental stress. It means physical stress, being injured. It means, you know, having way more on your plate than you can possibly deal with um, or any kind of tragedy or even just like a move, like a big event in your life that's not necessarily hard, uh, like traumatically, it just takes a lot more effort. Um, and then the third one is processed foods, like foods that don't have enough nutrients in them. And so those are like the three main things that cause the bad bacteria to start growing in the system. And the problem with this is that once they're growing there, they're sending out chemical messages to the rest of your body saying, hey, you know what? It'd be really nice if you would eat some ice cream right now. You know, I would really like a uh, chocolate cake. That sounds great. Like they want that sugar. They want the like quick carbs. 
and they're going to send these chemical messages and your body will start to respond. Um, and, and we really kind of become a, a sort of a puppet for these bacteria. So they're in your digestive tract. They're, they're, you know, secreting all of these toxins at the same time. So every time they eat your food, they secrete it. And then as you know, like with the digestive tract, your small intestine is basically a place where, where things are coming in and out of the bloodstream quickly and easily. I mean, and then this even happens in the large intestine. It's just so easy to get things into the bloodstream. So if they're producing toxins there, then that's getting absorbed and immediately running through your system. Your liver has to filter it. And this is, I call it the human sewer situation because when you have all these bad bacteria growing in the gut, your bloodstream is kind of their, their sewer. They're like a metropolis here and you are filtering out all these toxins. And that's where you really start to see um, various issues in people. That's where the anxiety comes from. It's a lot of these toxic buildup. It's, it's stimulating the central nervous system. You see a lot of skin issues you know, cause that, you know, your blood, the, the quality of your blood, it says everything about how good your skin, it looks and is working. And so, you know, essentially all these excess, to excess toxins will get dumped into the skin and start excreting out of the skin if it gets too much. So that's kind of the big issue. There's this, this human sewer and it's, it's kind of funky, it's gross. And, and you have to shift away from that. You have to start to get the good bacteria in the bad bacteria out. And like, you know, cultured fermented veggies is a great way to do that. I know it's so simple. It sounds so easy, but it, it makes such a big difference for people. It's pretty amazing. Speaking of easy, um, I think that a lot of people are overwhelmed and confused by fermented foods that they think it's a complicated thing. So, um, it, you know, there are probiotic supplements people can take, and then there are fermented foods, and then there's a variety of quality of fermented foods. You can buy some in the grocery store. Um, you can make them at home. Can you talk about these various ways to get probiotics and the benefits, what to, what to look for? Yeah. I mean, probiotic pills are probably the easiest way for, pe for most people. Um, and I think it can be a good start. And you might notice your digestion improving. You might see some immediate benefit. And most people do. Um, there's a lot of benefit that you will not see, like more immune system stuff. And there's some other amazing things happening about like micronutrient absorption. When you bring in these probiotics, you're not going to notice that immediately, but it's happening. But, um, you know, I think it's a great start, but I, when it really comes down to the better way, it's like getting some of these probiotic rich foods because it has lactic acid and some of these other natural antibiotics that will start to kill off some of the bad bacteria. So you get the, you get like an added bonus when you eat the fermented foods. Um, you know, when you're going to get raw unpasteurized sauerkraut or kimchi, make sure it's in the refrigerated section in the grocery store. Make sure it says unpasteurized on it. That's very important. If it's on the shelf, all of those bacteria are dead. They've been, they've been killed off. So you have to look for this in the refrigerated section labeled unpasteurized. Very, very important. Um, one of my other favorites would probably be kefir. Um, I, I, I think it's a lot better if you can make it at home, um, both kefir and sauerkraut. And I do teach people how to make sauerkraut at home. I have a video that I'm happy to share with your people. Um, and you know, the thing is, is like when you make this stuff at home, it's way more potent. It's just something to think about, but like I'm giving you stages, I'm giving you options. So depending on how busy you are, you can make the decision that's best for you. The most important thing is, is to get the probiotics in, right? Um, when it comes to kombucha, I just really want to call that one out for a minute. Cause this is a really big, you know, there's a lot of fermented foods. People are like it's fermented. It must be good for me. Kombucha is fermented. Um, beer is fermented, wine is fermented, liquor is fermented, beer, I mean, um, sorry, bread, cheese, you know, all these things are fermented actually. What we're looking at when we're talking about it from this angle is does it have live probiotics in it? Does it have live beneficial bacteria? So that's what we're looking for from this health standpoint. And when you look at kombucha, it's uh, some of them do and some of them don't. And for the most part, there is a lot of sugar, alcohol, and caffeine in kombucha. So when people are looking at like helping improve their overall health and like their skin quality and their digestive um, capability, kombucha isn't my number one choice. It's a little, it's a more, it's one that's going to work well for healthy people. Um, and even then you're only going to want to take like a shot 
or like maybe four ounces max per day. And you know, most people sell in 16 ounce bottles and are chugging 16 ounces a day. It's a little much for um, what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's more than what people ever historically have drank. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's a good point. So what are the things that people, how can people decide if, if making fermented foods is something that they should be doing? Well, I think that there's a couple of things to think about. One is that a 16 ounce jar of sauerkraut or raw unpasteurized fermented veggies is equivalent to about eight bottles of probiotic pills. So I guess part of it for you is if you like to dabble in the kitchen, if you want to make something that's so highly concentrate that when you eat it, you're getting, basically you finish that jar in less than a week, you're going to have, you know, eight probiotic pill bottles worth of probiotics in your system. I mean, that's major bonus. And you did it just for the cost of some cabbage and maybe a couple other veggies. Like, so I think from a cost standpoint, it's way more affordable um, but I also think it's great to get your hands on food and there's a lot of really easy ways to learn how to do this at home, like on your countertop and, and, and make it really easy. Um, so I think time is the biggest thing. Like, do people feel like they have the time? Do they want to experiment? But I also actually think that everybody should try to make it at least once. And the reason is, is because we live in this hyper sterile, like environment where we, we have like you know, we Clorox everything and Lysol everything. And I know we try to talk about not using chemicals, but it's the reality of a lot of people's homes and, and work environments is that it's just, we're sanitizing constantly. And what we don't realize is like, let's talk about the body for a second. When you sanitize the entire system, when you take antibiotics, sometimes you have to do this, but there are a lot of times when you don't have to, and people take antibiotics anyway. And th what this does is it sanitizes the whole system. And then kind of the first bacteria that, that you are exposed to are the ones that are going to grow the fastest in your system. So it makes it harder to re-inoculate yourself with these healthy bacteria. And so what we've learned is actually building up the bioterrain. That's what we call it, the environment in your body. When you make the, when you put the right food and the right environment and like a stress-free, happy li like mentality and, and lifestyle, these things support the right bacteria to grow. And they don't support the wrong bacteria. So it's a really nice situation. It, what we often think about is, oh, you have to kill off the bad bacteria in order to get better. But what we've also learned recently is if you bolster the good bacteria, you can kill off, they will do the work. They will kill off the bad bacteria on their own. So that's kind of what we want to think about is this environment, like the bioterrain. And so the reason that I recommend that everybody try to make unpasteurized you know, like fermented veggies at least once is because you're going to get a hands-on experience with this. What you do is you just basically chop up cabbage and add some salt and you can add some other veggies too, to make it taste better. And you put, pack it down into a jar, into a crock, you create an anaerobic environment. You get all the air out and literally it's like the veggies are sitting there with a little bit of brine up at the top. This environment is the bioterrain. We create the right environment and then these bacteria that were just kind of hanging out in small quantities on the vegetables start proliferating and growing like crazy. They start eating the sugars in the cabbage, digesting it, producing lactic acid and making a sour food. And that, that sourness, that lactic acid prevents any foodborne pathogens from growing. It's a very safe food to make and a safe food to eat. And it sits out on your counter. <laughs> which is crazy, right? For like usually one to four weeks, you'll let it sit on your counter and ferment. So that's going to blow most people's minds. I know it did mine because when I got done with my first batch, I was like, all right, I'm supposed to eat this now? Like this has just been sitting here like what, rotting <laughs> on my counter? Like how am I going to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think that's what's so amazing. This is going to help you break through this paradigm of this like sterile environment and instead start to learn how to work with bacteria and start to understand that like, eating this food, noticing if your body wants more. I mean, a lot of people will try it and be like, hmm, it's okay. But then once their body realizes what they got out of it, we'll start getting a, a real nice hankering for, for some more with their meals. And so I recommend that people eat about two forkfuls every day for like the first week, kind of just introduce it. And then you can start eating about two forkfuls with a meal, um, each meal. And this will help you digest your food more fully. Um, you know, I've even known people who have eaten it with quest with um, meals that were questionably 
uh, food poisoning, like, like kind of on the verge and have prevented themselves from getting sick. I mean, on that, on that note, I know people who have traveled across the world in places where everybody got sick. They got, you know, their whole, you know, India digestion experience and they took probiotic pills the whole time and never got it. So these guys, these little tiny microscopic bacteria are so strong and they do so much for us. And I want everyone to just get a chance to have that relationship, even if you just try it one time at home. Yeah, I know. I think it's a great thing for people to try. And I do think it's important for more people to get back in the kitchen and be making foods from scratch so they can understand you buy something like that in the store, you don't know all that goes into it. And learning about food and how how it changes and all those great things. I think that's fantastic. I love that you're teaching that as a as a program for people because I think that with making fermented foods, we can't explain exactly how to do that in our, you know, podcast interview today. You really have to follow someone, you need to follow some instructions, you need some guidance because there are some concerns. I mean, I know that well you like you want to store it. I've heard to store it in a dry cooler. That's how how I usually recommend it just in case you know, something, something does happen and you have a little explosion because it does create some pressure, right? In those containers. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, I do, I go pretty much into detail. Um, I have one video where I teach everybody and do you want me to tell you people where to find that? Is that yeah. right yeah. now? Mm-hmm. So if people go to summerbach.com forward slash Trevor, then you can get access to this first video where I show you how to make sauerkraut at home easily. We talk about what to use to store it in. We talk about how to, um, how long to have it out there. And then I have a few other videos too, that people can check out on what kind of bacteria live in there, what probiotics they're actually working with when they're making this. Yeah. And cabbage is such a great food, even when it's not fermented, it's Mm -hmm. a great food because of the, it's part of the cruciferous vegetable family. I think that people should be eating cruciferous vegetables every day to help with detoxification. So I think it's great. And then it just adds some additional bonus to this. So, but what about, let's talk about some of the other foods that people ferment that, that um, you mentioned um, kefir, for example, or yogurt. What do you think um, dairy versus coconut milk? What do you, what do you think about those sources? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think, you know, kefir is awesome because you know, it has such amazing health benefits. What it does is it helps digest the milk more fully so that people who even might be lactose intolerant can tend to enjoy kefir without issue. Um, So that's one thing to think about. For people who still struggle with dairy, you might want to switch over to coconut or even sometimes people can do it at home with almond milk or various other nut milks. Um, but yeah, I would use something other than dairy if dairy just isn't going to work or if you have like a casein intolerance that you can't digest the casein in, when you're making a ferment, it's still going to be there. So yeah, those are the considerations for that. Um, yogurt is another option. The only, here's my beef with yogurt. I, um, that's kind of, there's actually a pun there. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, my view with yogurt is that it, you know, yogurt is made in this particular way where they basically pasteurize the milk and then add some bacteria and let it ferment. And then oftentimes a lot of companies, what they've started to do is add more bacteria right before they package it so that it's now considered probiotic because that first round, usually all the bacteria die off which isn't the end of the world. It just means that we fermented some milk. We made it sour in a stable way so that it's not rotten. It's sour, but it's going to stay preserved for longer. And that's the, that's how milk ferments came around is we milk is good for us. It helps humans stay alive. It's a very good food source. And so people figured out how to ferment it so that it will last longer without going bad. That's the kind of history of it. So with the yogurt, generally those bacteria die off. It's not really probiotic, but it still has some lactic acid. You're digesting the, the, the sugars have been digested already for you. So there's going to be less issues intestinally. Um, the, even like the milk, the, the fats, the fatty acids actually change and become more absorbable. So there's benefit there to the ferment. Um, but yeah, the company, the yogurt companies are like, okay, let's make this probiotics. They add a bunch of probiotics. Again, it's not bad, but it's just 
for me, as I'm a little bit more of a purist, I'm thinking from the terms of like, I mean, how did my ancestors do this kind of stuff? You know, they didn't mm-hmm. use laboratory produced bacteria and add it in a powdered form to this. So, you know, it's just, you know, it depends on how purist you are or not. It, I don't have a judgment against people doing it because I think it's important to figure out the way that you can get this into your diet. Um, but but you want to, you really want to like look out there and see, is there a way to get it in here easily that is as natural as possible? You know, that's something that is as close to how your ancestors did as possible. And then that's one other thing, speaking of ancestors, is kind of look at your ancestry that will help you kind of determine. I know for some people who don't do dairy, they also don't do well on coconut, you know? Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to like go for some options till we find something that really works for their body type for their, you know, based on their genetics and their digestive capability. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and certainly when you look at some of the keepers and yogurts in the grocery store and you look at the sugar content, a lot of these things, they, a lot of these companies will add a lot of sugar. So you start with a good thing and then you, you know, add a bunch of sugar to it. It, That's, that's not going to help, right? No, it doesn't help. I mean, I generally don't, I, I wouldn't recommend the ones with sugar in them at all. I really wouldn't. I mean, you know, add your own stuff, add fruit to it, like do whatever you want to, to really spiff it up. Um, but I, it's just more and more sugar and that sugar doesn't feed the bacteria that you want to be living in your gut. It actually feeds the bad guys. It so. does. So it, it, it doesn't feed, cause I've always wondered about that because sugar sometimes works as a preservative. Like when you're canning peaches or something, you put sugar in to be a natural preservative, but when you, but it also, you also put sugar in to feed bacteria, right? So how, how do, do you understand how that works? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the way when, when you're adding sugar in as a preservative there, it's, it's being pasteurized. So every bacteria is killed off, but then with a high enough concentration of sugar, nothing can grow. Like mm-hmm. too much sugar will, it, it, it creates a sort of barrier where nothing can grow in it. It's just too much for any organism to handle. Okay. Okay, great. What are some other tips that you would share with, want to share with people about starting, learning how to ferment foods, um, starting this process of, of doing it yourself? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would say in terms of starting it yourself, I think you have a couple options. I mean, you probably want to go online and just start to research some stuff. I mean, I think that's first and foremost. I mean, like I said, you can go and get my video and start to learn how to make fermented veggies, but you can also start researching like on Facebook, there's a group called wild fermentation. They have like 43,000 members right now. I mean, it's a huge group and there's a lot of sharing that you can do. So you can join that group and you'll start to see a lot of really cool ideas flash across your Facebook feed and really get you inspired and see what other people are doing. I think that's a great way to start this process is just like get in some, into some community, start to see what everyone else is doing, you know, what experiments they're making at home. Um, like I said, I think that the fermented veggies are the easiest, but if you can get your hands on something called dairy kefir grains, and you can you have to like look online, maybe look on Etsy, or maybe go to this from wild fermentation group and ask if anybody has any. Um, dairy kefir grains are a way to make kefir at home, and it's actually one of the easiest processes I've ever seen. You get these little they're like gelatinous globules. They um, look kind of like cauliflower. They're like whitish clear, and these are like thousands of years old. We have literally been passing these from human to human for thousands of years. We don't know how to make these. And the reason they're in existence is because some, at some point they like formed, it's a little bacterial yeast colony and they formed when somebody was making some sort of milk ferment and kept it and has kept handing it on, like passing it down. It's really phenomenal. It's a cool part of this whole like kind of history of fermented foods. So if you can get your hands on some of these dairy kefir grains, all you do is you just get some milk, Raw milk, if you can get access to it, or you can, you know, heat it up, pasteurize it yourself. And then you plop them in and 24 to 48 hours later, you have your own kefir at home. And that's the stuff. That's the stuff that all the research is written about. That's the kefir that really is the healthiest for you. So that's another easy way to start. I mean, just getting your hands on the kefir grains may be a little tricky, but once you've got them, they grow, they multiply, and it is literally as easy as just like plopping them in milk, putting the lid on. 
24 hours. Oh, wow. That makes it really easy. And can you do that with coconut milk too? You said they're dairy kefir grains. So do, do, is there dairy in them for people who are, you know, can't have dairy? Um, it, there, you can do that with coconut milk as well. Mm-hmm. So you just take the dairy kefir grains and plop them in coconut milk. Every few months, you might need to feed them some milk because they didn't they didn't historically grow on coconuts. Um, so you may need to feed them some milk every once in a while to keep them kind of, uh, I don't know, healthy. Um, they don't multiply as quickly in the coconut milk, but that's how I do it. I use coconut milk um, or almond milk, and that's how I make it for myself. And I know that there are a lot of probiotic starters um, out there, and people talk about how you can add probiotics to food to speed up the process. How do you feel about these um, these starters? For like making sauerkraut and things like that, mm-hmm. To, yeah. You know, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I, I think that there's two sides to it. For people who are really sick, who have, you know, issues with digestion and have something going on where they need to get the right bacteria in their body, and if the wrong bacteria come in, they have like huge histamine reactions or, um, you know, issues where they like like might have like a SIBO flare up or something like that. For those people, sometimes using a starter culture for sauerkraut can be useful because then you they know they're only getting this one strain and that one will predominantly grow. But for the for everybody else, I mean, even if you're just like not in the best of health, but and you need your health to get better, a wild ferment is going to work fine. And in fact, in some cases, I think it's going to be better because taste wise, the ones where you do a wild ferment, where you let it go through its full natural succession of bacteria, there's actually like three major successions of bacteria that happen. That's that slower process of fermentation. It changes the flavor profile. It makes it taste slightly sweeter. Um, and generally the ferment will last longer because mm-hmm. it has this variety of bacteria and it's, it's just a little bit more stable. And then in the end, you end up with 13 different kinds of probiotics. So for, for the, the, you know, wild fermentation versus starter culture, when it comes to vegetables and a, and a lacto ferment, I'm, I'm usually going to recommend the wild ferment unless somebody has a very specific digestive need for just one bacteria. All right. And, and, you know, thank you so much for sharing all this because I think that today there's so much talk about the gut microbiome and the good bacteria that are in our, you know, that got good microorganisms that are in our digestive tract and keep maintaining that balance. And even as it applies to the skin, because the skin has its own microbiome. And when we, when we, we help the gut microbiome, we can help the skin microbiome. And, you know, it's so it's so important what you're talking about today. And um, it helps our health and on so many levels at the with our digestion, with our immune system, with our, you know, to help us with things like skin health and just having more energy and clarity of mind like you were talking about. Well, and even simple things like constipation, like I, that's probably the number one thing relieved by eating, you know, fermented veggies. Mm-hmm. And I hear it all the time. People are like, wow, I'm just, it's so easy. I'm going so regularly. I'm like, huh, yes. that's pretty awesome. That's the, the the number one thing. But kind of what you're saying with the skin microbiome, just to touch on that really quickly, what, you know, whatever your, lives in your body, whatever bacteria are living, you know, that determines what's being excreted through your skin, plain and simple. So if you have toxins being excreted through your skin that are just vile, it's going to change the pH on your skin and change what bacteria will grow there. Bacteria grow where depending on what the pH is. Like the pH is the precursor to what bacteria will grow. And it's the same in the gut. So you have to get your digestive system running well so that you have the right pH in every digestive system all the way down. That way the right bacteria will grow. Same on your skin. So if you have that amazing healthy pH internally, that will start to change the pH to a healthy pH externally and then get the right bacteria growing. And like you said, I mean, that's your, your defense. That's your immune system. It's, you know, it's, it's also pretty amazing too, because there's new studies that really show a huge link between anxiety and what kind of bacteria grow in your gut. Like they're showing that people who eat fermented foods are less anxious overall. I'm like, okay. So they basically, they have glowing skin, they're less anxious, they have more energy, and they generally have like clearer mental state. And then their digestion just hums. Right. And who and, doesn't? We, I think we all want that, right? Don't we all course. want that? Okay, perfect. So Summer, tell us again your website where people can find you. 
Yeah, I'm at summerbach.com. And then if you go to summerbach.com forward slash Trevor, you can get access to my video where I teach you how to make fermented veggies on your countertop at home. (laughs) Great. All right. Thanks, Summer, for sharing that with us. Really appreciate that. And thanks for your interview. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Summer Bach. To learn more about Summer, you can visit my website, drtrevorcates.com. Go to the podcast page with our interview and you'll see the information and links to her site as well as the free video that she mentioned. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the Spa Doctor podcast on my website or on iTunes so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. Thank you and we'll see you next time.